Hi, my name is Autumn Dixon, and this week is March 25th through the 31st of the Come Follow Me program associated with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The verses for this week are a little all over the place because essentially they provided passages in which we can turn to the Savior as we're preparing for Easter. So not all the verses are in the Book of Mormon like they will be for the rest of the year. And in fact, the verse that I want to talk about today is found in the New Testament. It is an oft quoted verse. It is a favorite verse of many, many people, but I still want to talk about it anyway. (laughs) Now, this verse was shared the night of the Passover. So the Savior institutes the sacrament. He's teaching lots of doctrine. He is washing the feet of the disciples and he is prophesying lots of things going on. And he also shares this verse. So this is John 14. And it is verse 27. It says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So very, very famous verse, right? Now, a lot of times I feel like we read that verse and we're like, peace, peace, talking about peace, right? But when we look at the context of this verse, (laughs) peace in the way that the world defines it, was not about to be found. (laughs) In fact, for these disciples, the Savior is sitting with them and he's like, I'm going to give you, I'm going to send you peace. (laughs) And within the next few days, the Savior is going to be taken from them and tortured and killed. They were going to find themselves in a lot of danger. Lots of scary things happening. The way that the world defines peace was very quickly going to be snatched from these disciples, their hopes for the future, what they thought it was going to look like. All of these things was going to be taken away from these disciples. And yet Christ promised peace anyway. He chose to say that he would send peace. So what kind of peace is he offering? How do we find that peace? Because we also live in a time where there's plenty of turmoil. Different kind of turmoil, but there's turmoil. And so we need to know how to find this peace that Christ is talking about, because Christ obviously was not talking about a lack of turmoil. How do we find the peace that Christ is talking about? That peace is not a quiet morning or perfect children. It is not plenty of money to do whatever you want and to feel a false sense of security. It is not perfect health. That is not what he was offering his disciples. Part of the point of earth was to experience turmoil, right? (laughs) That was a huge part of earth. And so the Savior providing us an escape route from that turmoil would kind of diminish the point of the plan of salvation. We needed to experience turmoil. So how, what kind of peace was the Savior talking about? Now, this is a very simplistic phrase that I'm going to share, but I feel like there's plenty to unpack here plenty to talk about. And the kind of peace that I believe the Savior is offering comes through faith. Faith brings peace. We talk about that a lot, (laughs) like it's said a lot. I think we believe that principle, but have we really thought about what that means? Because I feel like as I was growing up, I acted in faith a lot. I went to church, went to the temple, kept the commandments in a lot of ways. But I don't feel like I was experiencing this peace that the Savior was talking about. I was still experiencing a lot of turmoil. Now, faith is an action word, right? And by keeping some of these commandments, I was able to avoid situations that could have brought even more turmoil. That is definitely a thing. So in that sense, I was experiencing peace. But the kind of peace that I believe the Savior wants us to be experiencing all the time, I don't believe I was experiencing that even though I was acting in faith, right? And so there is a specific kind of faith, an aspect of faith that we need to be experiencing in order to also be experiencing that peace that the Savior is offering. Because not all turmoil comes from our choices, right? 
not all turmoil comes from our choices and we are inevitably going to make mistakes, but the Savior still meant for us to experience peace. So how do we experience it in these other circumstances? Yeah. Now, in order to answer this question, I actually want to go back and look at these disciples who were promised peace and were going to face all of these terrible things. This is not a critique of the disciples. When you go back into the Bible dictionary and you search the Holy Ghost, it talks about how the Holy Ghost was not fully functioning in the time of the Savior for some reason. It doesn't really provide an explanation reasoning for that. I don't know if we even have an explanation for it. But for some reason, the Holy Ghost was not functioning in the same manner when the Savior was experiencing his mortal ministry. And we know how essential the Holy Ghost is in understanding doctrine, receiving testimonies, receiving extra strength and spiritual gifts and power, right? Holy Ghost is pretty essential. So this is not a critique of the disciples and what they went through, right? But I do want to talk about it because if we can observe the past, it's a lot easier to take those lessons and apply it to our future. So I want to look at these experiences that these disciples went through, and I want to look at what actually happened without this faith that I want to talk about today. And then I want to go back through the same circumstances, but how it would have looked differently if they had had faith. So without faith, the disciples are sitting at the Passover and the Savior is teaching them and he's saying, let not your heart be troubled. And he's also saying, I'm going to die. And <laughs> I want you to think for a second, the, the disciples are probably like, okay, like you're going to die, but you also tell us we need to be born again. So how literal are we talking here? Right. There are a lot of reasons why they might not have fully understood that the Savior is going to actually be dying and taken away from them. So very shortly after <laughs> the Savior is taken away from them and they find themselves in danger, they watch they know that the Savior gets tortured and crucified, and they are the ones who are taking care of his body. And I can imagine as they're taking care of his body, it's in a loving manner. But I also wonder what emotions they were feeling, whether they felt betrayed. Like, you told us to not be troubled. You told us you would be there for us. You told us more was coming for us, that you would always be there. And you're dead, right? Maybe a feeling of betrayal or anger, shock. Maybe they felt abandoned and frustrated. They mourned this leader that they had come to really love. And they were also mourning this future that they had in their mind that they had expected. And then, of course, the Savior rises and, and things change very quickly. Now let's go back through those circumstances. So same thing happens. They go through the Passover and they're hearing these things. And they have faith. So the Savior gets taken away from them. Now, how this faith plays out could have happened in a couple of different ways. They could have had a better knowledge of what was coming because they had faith like, oh, the Savior is going to die and this is really necessary. And that changes everything. When the Savior is taken away and tortured and crucified, it would hit different, right? Because they were like, this was necessary. This had to happen. The Savior had to die. It had to happen because our sins wouldn't be paid for unless he went through this process. And so there would still be grieving for what their Savior went through, but there would also be a sense of peace. They knew what was coming, right? Because of that faith. Maybe they went through it with faith without really understanding what was happening. And they didn't yet have a knowledge that the atonement and the crucifixion was all necessary, right? But the faith aspect was still there. So when all of these things were happening... They felt deep down, I know him. I know him. I have spent time with him. He has performed miracles. He is so powerful. And he promised that he would come back. I didn't know he was actually going to die, but he also promised he was going to come back. I know he's going to come back. I know he's going to take care of things. He's done it in the past with past Israelites. He can do it again. I know the Savior's coming back. And then the Savior comes back. Now, it's the same experience, um, but it's the same events, but the experience is totally different. So when the Savior goes to Thomas, he said, 
blessed are those who have not seen but believe. That verse was always really interesting to me because I didn't fully understand it when I was growing up. Because I was thinking that the Savior is just like, oh, you are just more wonderful if you haven't seen and you're going to be blessed for that. But that's not really what he's saying. (laughs) What the Savior is saying is if you believe and if you have faith in these promises that I've made to you, even though you haven't seen them yet, if you have faith in them, it's going to completely change your experience. He was telling Thomas, you didn't know what was happening, but if you had been able to believe me, I wasn't going to shower these arbitrary blessings on you, but your experience would have been totally different because you would have understood it, right? You would have understood it a little bit better. And if not understood it, you would have known that it was going to work out. That's what the Savior means when he says, blessed are those who have not seen, but still believe. It's because it alters your experiences on earth. I don't understand what this is, why this is happening, but I do know my Savior. I know he loves me. I know he is powerful. I know that he keeps his promises and that is why they're blessed. Like you haven't seen, but you believe that's why you're blessed. It's not arbitrary blessings. It's because it changes your experience. Now that is a fine and dandy principle for when you feel faith, (laughs) but it is unwise in my opinion to try and force faith (laughs) It doesn't usually result in actual faith (laughs) to try and force it and tell yourself to be faith and put your head down and beat it against the wall until you have faith, right? That doesn't really work. It's not helpful. Don't try it. So instead, how do we actually develop this faith and this peace? Now, faith is an action word. You prepare for tomorrow by keeping the commandments today in that sense, but faith is also an action word in your mind. I feel like it's so easy to forget that we are in control of our minds and our beliefs, and we get to choose what beliefs that we invest in. That belief is not something that happens to you. It's something you choose to invest in. There's another verse that I want to read. This one is in Alma. So we are in the Book of Mormon this week as well. So this is Alma, it's chapter 34, and it is verse 31. And says, Yea, I would that you would come forth and harden not your hearts any longer. For behold, now is the time in the day of your salvation. And therefore, if you will repent and harden not your hearts, immediately shall the great plan of redemption be brought about unto you. So I'm going to talk about the end. Harden not your hearts. So therefore, if, therefore, if you will repent and harden not your hearts, immediately shall the plan of redemption be brought about unto you. So... The reason that this verse always strikes me is because of that word immediately. Because oftentimes I feel like when we're thinking about the plan of salvation, we think about it, oh, it's going to come in the next life, right? Like that's when all of the glory and the peace and everything, that's when it all comes. It it comes when we die. But that's not true. (laughs) Immediately shall the great plan of redemption be brought about unto you. Part of redemption, part of redemption is peace. In fact, I feel like that's a very significant portion of redemption is peace. And so I'm going to replace the word redemption with peace. So repent and harden not your hearts immediately shall peace be brought about unto you. Now we've talked about the repentance aspect before, right? Any step towards becoming like the savior is repentance. At least that's how I define repentance. Anytime you're learning something new, learning a talent, learning something about the savior, when you are overcoming sin or developing a talent, all of these steps, all of these little changes that are occurring to you, in my mind, that's repentance. So of course that's going to bring peace. When I learn something new, learning about the Savior, all of these things bring peace. So repentance, we got that, we figured that out. But there's a second part and it's to not harden your heart. You have to have a soft heart and having a soft heart is a conscious choice. Faith in his promises and how he feels about you is a conscious choice. Don't disbelieve him anymore. (laughs) Don't harden your hearts. Don't disbelieve that he adores you. Don't disbelieve that he, let me rephrase that, believe that he is capable of making everything okay in the end. 
And even though it won't be made okay until the end, it changes your experience up until that end comes, right? I experienced glimpses of peace as I was growing up. And I also feel that I was protected from a lot of circumstances that could have brought turmoil because I acted in faith. But it wasn't until I also softened my heart until I consistently spent time with him and got to know him. It wasn't until I started to choose to believe that he loved me and could make up for everything. That was when peace started coming immediately and more consistently. I still have moments of darkness, right? But the peace comes back faster and it comes back through thicker darkness. Eternity. Everything we're going to be experiencing after this life, it is not perfect and peaceful in the sense that the world describes it, right? Our God still experiences sorrow. Things are not perfect. He has to watch what we're doing to each other here on earth, right? And he had to watch his son suffer. Eternity is not perfect and peaceful in the sense that the world describes it, which is why we need Christ's peace. Because if we try to, if we're searching so hard and counting on peace in the sense of the, that the world describes it, we will be unprepared for the next life. But if we can seek peace in the way that the, in the way that Christ promises it by having faith in him, his love, his ability to keep his promises, then we will be able to be happy for eternity. I have a testimony of my savior. I have a testimony that he loves us and that he can take care of everything. And that comes as you get to know him. You don't have to force it or beat yourself up when you don't have faith. You just have to get to know him. And that faith grows as you spend time with him and you allow yourself to believe, okay, he means what he says when he says he loves me. He means what he says when he promises that he can make everything okay. When you choose to soften your heart, that's when the peace comes immediately and more consistently, not perfectly because we're not perfect yet, but immediately and more consistently. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.